This is about a Christian that is struggling with sins in their past that sort of overwhelm them, that take over them. He says, if your heart condemn you, it's a good thing in the sense that you are aware of sin, you are conscious of sin, it can lead you to repentance. But if it's something that God has already forgiven, God is greater than that. He is greater than your past. He is greater than all of those things. And if you've turned to Christ uh, for forgiveness and salvation, then you are free from that condemnation. And so let God be greater than your heart. John the Apostle says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Thank you. You can be seated. And I just want to welcome you this morning, and thank you for joining us uh, here at City Baptist. It's great to see you. If it is your first time, uh, we just want to say welcome, and uh, we're, we're really honored that you would choose to worship with us today. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue our study through the book of 1 John, and uh, I want to remind us about a few things as we get into it. Uh, and the first thing I want to remind us of is that uh, these are the final words of the Apostle John to a group of believers that... As far as we understand right now, we're believers that were in the second and third generation of Christians following the dispersion and persecution that came in Jerusalem. Uh, what we understand is that John, as the last living apostle, uh, had a really direct focus for us. And his focus for us was squarely on asking the question and challenging us with the fact is, are you a genuine follower of Jesus Christ? Are you truly a believer? Are you someone that is walking in the light? Now, help us with this. John has been uh, very much, is that the, the mic issue you guys had last week? I was told about a mic issue last week, and I just said it was Levi's fault, you know? <laughs> All right, I don't know what it is. All right, well, it's time for a new mic. Here, hand me that for right now in case it gets worse, and I'll switch it up. Is that too distracting for you guys? No? It, what's more distracting, me coming off the platform, grabbing another microphone, and talking about it, uh, or just ignoring it? Okay, we'll do our best, uh, and we'll uh, take an offering after the service for a new microphone. Sound good? There must be something going on here. I don't know what it is. Um, okay. Uh, John, that's who we're talking about. And uh, he's, he's been reminding us about some things, and he's been kind of in our face about it. Uh, I don't know about you, but the book of 1 John has been really uh, just challenging as he kind of puts it right out there and challenges us with this idea of walking uh, in the light and creating for us, or not creating for us, but revealing to us some identifying markers, uh, spiritual fruit that would identify us as true followers of Jesus Christ. In chapter 3 here, we know the primary focus, though, has been on the subject of love. And uh, beginning with 1 John uh, chapter uh, 3 and verse number 1, that first verse, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now think about that. He's, he's exclaiming to us. He says, Can you believe that God loves us this much? And I love that thought. And he, he expounds it to us and just says, I cannot believe it is amazing what manner of love God has uh, given upon us and, and, and given to mankind. And throughout the chapter uh, that we've been in, he emphasizes love as one of the defining characteristics of a person that follows Jesus. Not just love in word, saying I love you and I love the whole world, but love in action that's lived out, that's visible, that is sacrificially given to the world and, of course, to our Christian community as well. That's one of the great things about love uh, is that it's to be distributed liberally among the people of God within the church of God. And this should be a place where people feel loved, are loved, and there is actionable love that is revealed and takes place. And so he's encouraging us with that thought. He also told us, though, in verse 13 of chapter 3, that this kind of love is going to be rejected. It's a love that's going to be uh, actually hated by the world, those who don't really understand what it is. And the reason we know that it's hated is because it is a reflection of Jesus and his love for the world. Remember, Jesus is the ultimate example of true love by laying down his life for those that generally or naturally hated him. 
As we mentioned in, in our time of prayer, today is traditionally called Palm Sunday. And it's because it was one week before the resurrection uh, that Jesus made his way into Jerusalem. And while he was recognized for a brief moment as the Messiah and declared as the Messiah by the same people who would crucify him, we, have to, we cannot disconnect that experience from what Jesus was doing. I put it this way, we cannot uh, disconnect the moment of his triumphal entry. We cannot disconnect it from the mission that Jesus was going to Jerusalem to die. That's why he was going there. That's why uh, he was headed in that direction. And he was doing that to demonstrate his great love for us. And he did that by the death of his son on the cross just a few days from that moment of celebration. Christ's willingness to go to the cross is the great example of genuine love. Love that uh, is without question. Love that is without expectation of return. After all, what could you and I give to God in thanks for his love for us? I'm sure that John's heart was full of the memories of those moments, thinking about Christ and his expression of love as he writes to the church. And he's writing to us to tell us that that kind of love, that sacrificial, incredible love that Christ demonstrated on the cross is the primary proof, it is evidence to this world that you and I have been born again and that we are walking in the light. So this has been the primary theme of chapter three. But I want to ask a question this morning for us all. What about those times that you don't feel like you're walking in the light? We know that we are to live for God and we're to express this love and be his physical representation here in this earth through the work of the Spirit in our lives and we're to uh, share love with Christ. But what, what, what about when we don't feel like it? <laughs> what about those times where our relationship with God is weakening? Maybe even you would consider it failing. What about those moments when in self-reflection of your own heart, you don't like what you see? Let's be honest today. Have you ever had that moment? Where in self-reflection, you don't really like where you are at as a Christian? Maybe those moments that after months and years of being saved and laboring and serving and fighting against temptations of the world, you're trying to follow Christ, but you're still so discouraged by the pull of your flesh, by your sinful desires of your past and your present. Have you ever been praying in a moment with the Lord and in your heart while in prayer to your Savior, in your heart, you say, look at you. Who do you think you are coming before God and asking him for anything? Who do you think you are just this week? You did things and you said things and you thought things that would disqualify you from ever receiving anything from God. Remember that attitude that you had yesterday. Remember how you got angry with your wife for no reason. What about that unclean thought that uh, went through your mind? Uh, what about that person that you saw in the street and you could have met a need or helped them, but you just walked right by without helping? What kind of Christian are you? What right do you have to come before God and ask him for anything? Or maybe this is probably the most common phrase that a lot of people think, and, and I've struggled with this. How do you even call yourself a Christian? and you find yourself in this place. Thoughts like these can shut down your prayer life in a moment. <laughs> and sometimes, even in my own life, I've been kneeling in prayer, and I've ended up just kneeling there, not crying out to God, not talking to my Savior, but just simply over in my mind, being condemned, condemning myself over and over and over about how I'm so frail, and I'm a sinner, and it can be overwhelming. Some people, many people, even begin to doubt some would question their salvation. Because why would a Christian act and think and desire things that are so clearly against God and his word? Well, this is the question that John wants to answer for us today. As he addresses for us the reality of the Christian life, and this is a very real thing about the Christian life, the pain of a condemning and a doubting heart. How do we get through that? How do we, when we lack confidence and maybe even are struggling in some ways with assurance, how do we move forward uh, because we aren't walking in the light or we're just struggling in these areas? Well, John's going to help us with this, and he does so by pointing us to the good news of the gospel and how the gospel can develop in us confidence when we find ourselves in those troubling times. I believe this message is for us today. I think it's a timely message. We need it. 
We need to hear this because often, week to week, as we hear from Scripture uh, God's desire for us and God's plan for us, we often fall short of that over and over and over again. And it gets discouraging. So what do we do in those moments? What do we do in those times where we feel like we have, like we're just struggling, we're in seasons of doubt? Where is the evidence of our faith? John's going to help us with that. And we'll begin again in verse number 18. He says, My little children, let us not love in word, Neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now, verse 18, I realize Levi covered that last week in our message, but it is somewhat of a transitional verse between this subject of love and now transitioning into this new subject about assurance. And he does it by reminding us that our love should be something that is tangible, not just something that is something that's heard about, but it's something that's actually seen in our actions, something that is uh, um, uh, that is like actually tangible, you'd be like, okay, they are expressing love. Now we understand that because you and I uh, know what it's like when someone really loves us, right? Like there's expressions of love and we, we feel that and, and, and we identify that. But notice as well in the verse, he says, we should not just love in word or in tongue, uh, but in deed. And then he says this, and in, what's that word? Say it with me, truth. So we should love in action, that's our deeds, but there should also be love in truth. Well, what does he mean by that? Let me ask you this question. Who is truth? Who is truth? God is truth, isn't he? Some of you almost said the wrong answer. God is truth, okay? God's word is truth, okay? That is absolutely truth. And so what he's trying to get across to us is that if we're to love in our actions, but there also must be some truth to those actions, meaning there must be a reality behind the actions. There must be a actual outflow of something that comes from someone and somewhere that is not actually out of our flesh. Here's what I'm trying to say. I said that in a terrible way. Let me help you, okay? What he's saying here is that our actions can be faked, can't they? How many of you have experienced someone expressing love to you and it wasn't real? Yeah, all of us have experienced that, okay? Well, what is he saying here? He's saying that genuine love that is real, that is truthful, is founded in and flows from a transformed heart that is Christ-like. You say, well, what kind of love is that? That is the kind of love that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 5, where he says, love your enemies. I hate this verse, by the way. Love your enemies. That's, that's a wrong saying. I strongly dislike it, but it's truth, okay? It's true. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. To love in deed and love in truth means that there is a reflection of God in the way that we demonstrate our love. And it's seen, and it's not just the people that we like or people that we uh, make us happy or people that we agree with, but to all people in a way that is possible in no other way except the spirit or the evidence of God is at work in our lives. Now, this is the kind of love that he's talking about here that can make a difference. This is genuine here. Now, now listen, when we begin to talk about loving our enemies and those that have hurt us, it gets really, really difficult really, really fast, doesn't it? Because we start to think about all of those people that we have not showed love to. But this is the idea here, that truth, love that is founded in truth, is not possible without the work of the Spirit of God in you. It is not possible in your flesh. It is only possible as an outflow of the transformation that has taken place in your heart. If you've ever genuinely loved an enemy, if you've ever genuinely blessed someone that has, that has talked bad about you, if you've ever genuinely tried to love someone uh, who hates you by all, uh, all imagination and by all metrics, hates you, if you've never experienced that, but if you have experienced that, you know that it did not come from yourself. <laughs> You know that it was supernatural in nature. It was unique. It was special. It is not like the love our world has. It's a love that's uniquely Christian and distinctively found in those that follow Jesus Christ. And so he says that we need to love in truth, this kind of love that makes a difference. And John is emphasizing it because it's not something that we can create on our own. It is something that is only possible with the work of God through us. And this all sounds really great in theory. But here's the question. How do we know that we have that ability? How do we know that we can actually love in this way? How do we know that we are in the truth? Well, verse 19 picks it up. And hereby we know. Now, this is a great word. It's seen all throughout the book of 1 John. He wants us to know. Remember, he's he's battling against the Gnostics, those that say, you know, I don't know, we have a special word of knowledge. uh, And he's battling against that. And he's saying, no, it is possible for you to know some things. And he says, I want you to know that we are of the truth. He wants you to know that you are of God. 
you can know for sure that you are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. John, I think, maybe sees that there's a little bit of confusion on our faces with that first verse. And so he clarifies it for us. Here's what he's saying. He says, I know you're maybe wondering what I just said, but I want to tell you how you can know that you are of the truth. I want you to have confidence. I want your heart to be assured. Have you ever wondered, am I truly of Christ? Have you ever wondered that? Am I really saved? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Here's what John is getting at. He said, I want you to know, I want you to know for sure that you are in the truth. You say, well, how does he do that? Well, he gives us some areas in the Christian life that when they are understood properly can help us to know that we are in the truth. They are confidence givers. They are assurances of our genuine faith in Christ. And I got to tell you, today's message is a bit of a thinker. You know what I mean by that? It means you got you to be locked in. Okay, You got to be focused today. So help me out. Don't fall asleep. It was, time change was two weeks ago. You should have recovered by now. Okay. I had somebody tell me that last week. They're like, oh man, time change just got me. You know, I was like, it's been 10 days. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's like you didn't fly across the, across the world, you know. Okay, so we're going to lock into it because he, he, this is really, really important, church, because I know uh, that when I was saying to you, have you ever wondered, am I truly a Christian? Have you ever struggled with doubts because of the way you're not feeling connected to God and disconnected? Every single one of us has experienced that. Every single one of us. And you were all locked, up, locked in on me at that point. But let's stay locked in as we look at these assurances, okay? The first assurance that he encourages us with is that you know you are of God. You know that you are in the truth because there is assurance in your heart. So if, number one, there's assurance in our hearts. Let's look at verse 20 through 21. He says, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if, you are, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. There's a couple of key words here that we need to identify in this passage, and they are the words condemn and confidence. Both of these words are key for us understanding assurance in the heart of the believer. First of all, John says this. He says, if your heart condemns us. What he's trying to, uh, what he's trying to help us to understand, he's not saying uh, it, it's possible that it might be. He's actually making a definitive statement. Your heart is going to condemn you at some point. And what he's trying to get across is that even though Christ has propitiated for our sins, as he talked about, he is the, the uh, fulfillment of the sin debt. And even though in his perfect atoning work on the cross has forgiven us of our sins, we, we may still experience a condemning heart or maybe some would consider this a guilty conscience. Sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we disobey. Sometimes hate and lust and bitterness and anger uh, just uh, seemingly comes out of nowhere and our old flesh reveals itself once again. And we find ourselves sometimes even beating ourselves up and thinking about past sin. Have you ever experienced that? It is amazing. You're just driving down the road and you think of something you did when you were 19, you know? Those of you that are 19, something you did when you are 14. <laughs> and you're like, I can't. And you're just driving there like, man, I really did that person wrong. <laughs> what a terrible thing. And, and, and you get to go down this whole pathway and, and man, this happened to me and I went through all this difficulty and it just kind of overwhelms us and we begin to dwell on it. And if it's, if it's sin in our past, we begin to beat ourselves up over it and it bothers us. It really bothers us. So let me ask you a question. Is that a bad thing? Is it a bad thing that you struggle sometimes with feeling this guilt or this condemnation, as he describes it here, of your heart? Is that a bad thing? I want to tell you, it's actually not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. Now, let me explain it to you. Some of you are like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Let me explain. Because those that do not know Christ don't ask those questions. Think about that for a moment. Sometimes people are like, I can't believe that I'm, I'm feeling still some, some, some guilt for my past. Now, we're going to cover that in a moment, okay? But those that are without Christ don't feel those kind of things. Those that do not have the Spirit of God within them don't struggle with those big questions of whether or not I am of Christ. A person that has a rebellious heart that uh, is, is not born again, they're not bothered by a life that would be honoring to God. It doesn't bother them whether or not they're following God, but for a true Christian, it can cause us some trouble. So what do we do with those gnawing accusations? What do we do with our conscience and struggling? Do we ignore them? <laughs> do we rationalize our behavior? I'm going to tell you, first of all, if there's sin that needs to be confessed, if there's a direction in your life that needs to be changed, then you should confess it and forsake it. Okay, that's for sure. 
We, we know that. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So forgiveness and confession is really, really important. But what if it's something that maybe happened in the past that you already asked God to forgive you for? What if it's something that was uh, 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 long ago? Maybe, maybe it's just that you're struggling to live the Christian life. Then we set our hearts on the fact that, that John brings up here, and I love this. God is greater than our hearts. You see that? He said, if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. So what is he, what is he meaning, or what is he trying to say here? It means that when you struggle over past sin that has been forgiven, that you have confessed, we must remind ourselves that God knows our hearts as well as our actions. I try to distill it this way. God's voice of assurance is stronger than the accusing voice in your hearts. We need to remind ourselves that if Christ is our Savior, then Jesus died for our sins and we can live free from condemnation. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Again, there's some defining qualities in here. Again, he says, if you're walking after the Spirit and you're pursuing God, uh, there's no condemnation over the sin that's been forgiven. Remember, Christ died for your sins. He has forgiven you of those sins. In verse uh, 18 of John chapter 3, not First John, but actual gospel of John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. He said, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John says here, when you feel condemned in your heart and your mind, remember, if there's sin, you can turn to Christ and be forgiven. But if you're struggling with your past, if you're struggling with something that has been forgiven, it's under the blood, you confessed it, you made right with God, you have, you have been saved, then you need to remind you that God's forgiveness is greater than your sin. Amen. His forgiveness, and when he forgave you of that sin, it's forgiven. And you can move on from that. And so in the Christian life, remember, he's speaking primarily to Christians. So please don't try to, uh, this isn't about a, a, a condemnation to hell or, or salvation thing. This is about a Christian that is struggling with sins in their past that sort of overwhelm them, that take over them. He says, if your heart condemn you, it's a good thing in the sense that you are aware of sin. You are conscious of sin. It can lead you to repentance. But if it's something that God has already forgiven, God is greater than that. He is greater than your past. He is greater than all of those things. And if you've turned to Christ uh, for forgiveness and salvation, then you are free from that condemnation. And so let God be greater than your heart. Let God be greater than your heart. Man, we need that. I need that today. Because it's so, it's amazing. Our enemy will use that. And in those moments, right? In those moments when we are struggling, in those moments where uh, we are, uh, we are um, uh, maybe not walking with the Lord, and so it just sort of spirals, you know? It kind of brings this whole thought spiral, and we're thinking of all of these things in our past. God is greater than your heart, okay? What does that mean? That means the truth of the Word of God is more important than what you're thinking in that moment. Because it's about truth, right? Walking in the truth. And God has forgiven you of those things. You are forgiven and you are cleansed. Now, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes God might bring something up into your mind because you did somebody wrong and you maybe need to go back and make it right with them. That happens sometimes. That's a hard thing, by the way. <laughs> That's a hard thing when that happens. But if it's just that you're down on yourself and you're struggling, I would say, first of all, get your sin right with God, get things confessed, and then remember that God is greater than your heart. When that happens, something incredible takes place. Look back again at verse 21. He says, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence with God. The alternative to a condemned heart is a confident heart. And I like this. Because he says, when you're right before the Lord, you're trusting and you're faithful to his word. You're going to be loving and you're going to be giving sacrificially. You're going to be pursuing his calling in your lives. At that point, when we are pursuing God and, and we are right before him, and as I often say, your sin is up to date with God. You're, you're not walking in, in sinful flesh. You're pursuing him and, and you're, you're, you're desiring to walk with him. It is then that your hearts are filled with assurance and confidence, knowing that all things are well with God. There's no more condemnation. There's no more guilt. You know that you're forgiven. You know that you're cleansed through Jesus Christ and you are acceptable to God and your heart then can rejoice in the confidence and assurance of him. And that is an amazing place to be. It is a wonderful place to find yourself. And if you've ever experienced those moments of the Christian life where you're just totally confident and you're walking with God and things are right with him, man, it is, it is life changing. It's something that I want more and more and more in my life. And it gives you so much confidence because you know then that you are in his will. 
I think about Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. This is the goal here, that there be a peace, a confidence, an assurance that we are, we are in Christ and he is in us and I'm forgiven and I can then live different in this life and in this world because of his forgiveness. And this is what God desires for us, that his greatness over our sin and over our guilt would live rent-free in our minds. You know what I mean by that, right? That's what I want. I want, I want this confidence living rent-free in my mind. Meaning it's, it's there all the time and it's easy, okay? It's something that's at the forefront of my mind. I'm always focused on it. It doesn't cost me anything, but it renews my mind and my heart daily. So John is saying here, listen, one of the ways you know that you're in the truth is that there's an assurance in your heart. I got to ask you, are, is there assurance in your heart today? Is there assurance or are you struggling with that? If you're struggling with that, certainly there needs to be maybe a level of confession that needs to take place in your life. And we're going to talk about that here uh, in a moment along those ideas of, of confession. But there needs to be assurance in our hearts. The second thing that shows us and reveals to us that we're in the truth is that there are going to be answers in our prayers. Answers in our prayers. Look again at verse number 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. A couple of key phrases there. We're doing his commandments and we're doing what is pleasing in the sight of God. This verse promises a lot, doesn't it? Man, that's a big promise. That's a big promise, God, (laughs) that whatever you ask, he's going to do it for you. And I know for me, I look at this verse and I say, well, that's actually not true. Some of you are like, is he allowed to say that? (laughs) Because in my life, there's been a lot of things that I've asked for that haven't happened. There's a lot of prayers that I've had. Well, what is John doing here? John's giving us a conditional truth. You have to read the the verse in its entirety. You know, you can't just be like, oh man, whatever we ask, we're going to receive of him. I'm going to name it and I'm going to claim it. This is what my life is going to be about. You got to read the whole verse. Why? Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. This is a very important theological truth for us to understand. This response or this promise is based off of verse 21, that when a believer's conscience is clear, we can come before God without fear and with bold confidence. But it suggests, rightfully so, that we are truly right with God. You see that there? There's a, there's a caveat. You can't just be like, God, you promised me whatever I ask you're going to do. And that's what a lot of Christians do, by the way, don't they? And we say that, and then we pray for something, and it doesn't happen, and then we get mad at God. And we say, man, God's just a big old disappointment in my life. I've been asking for all these things, and he hasn't fulfilled any of my prayer requests. Why would there even be a verse verse like this in Scripture? Okay, I think you guys are with me. Because we've got to be right with God for that to happen. When you are fully surrendered to the Lord, when you are pursuing what God loves, when you are living with a desire to bring glory to him, you will then be able to have a bold and a clear conscience. And another benefit is that there are going to be answers to prayer within your life. However, your prayers are a reflection of your desire to pursue Christ. Now, I just lose my slides there. Let's look at verse, uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. All right, maybe that computer just reset itself. Sorry, thanks, Tim. <laughs> I definitely did. If it says that, we have a problem. So. <laughs> Man, microphones, computers, let's pass a hat, right? I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right, you have your Bible. So let's go over to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. So he's saying here that there's going to be answers to prayer, but there's something that's unique. If you're walking with God, then you're going to actually pray within the will of God for your life. 1 John 5, 14 says this, and this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we ask anything according to his will. Again, there is a condition that is connected to it. When we come to God with a pure heart and an obedient intention, we can have confidence that he is going to hear and answer our prayers. Here's the big thought. Obedience to God is key to answered prayer. If we are going to please God, then we must obey God. A father cannot uh, reward his child if the child disobeys. A father is not going to grant a child's request not if he's in obedience because he's trying to teach him good behavior. I think about Psalm 66, verse 18. It says, if I regard iniquity, that sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. 
understand this today. The way that you will receive the things that you are asking God for is to simply obey God. Please hear this, church. He will not reward your unfaithfulness and disobedience. Think about that for a moment. God will not reward your unfaithfulness and disobedience. And so if you're living a fake life, if you're uh, living for sinful pursuits, if you are disregarding the word of God, if you're not faithful to read his word, you're not faithful to the church that he loves and gave himself for, you're not serving others, you're not genuinely loving people, you're not giving, I got to tell you, if you're unfaithful to God in those ways, be aware that your prayers are going to be a struggle. Not because he's abandoned you, but you're missing out on the confidence and the uniqueness of going to God in prayer, knowing that, God, I am pursuing you and I'm living a life that is pleasing to you. Now, this is not a, this is not a, uh, 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 man, what is the term I'm looking for, Levi? Help me out here. It's not a uh, pay to play, okay? It's not a, uh, it's not a, what, what, what is it called? Come on, you, gotta, you haven't figured it out yet? What? It's not works-based, okay? What's the, what, you know, help me out, man. I thought we were friends. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not a prosperity gospel. There it is. Okay. All right. You're with me. Good. Man, uh, sometimes, man, the mic's, you know, going out. My brain's going out. So there we go. Prosper, it's not a prosperity gospel that like, okay, I'm going to do this and God's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sow a thousand and God, I'm going to reap a hundred thousand. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the just reality that if you're living in disobedience to God, he's not going to hear and answer your prayers. I didn't say it. John is saying it here. If you are pleasing God and you're obeying God, then you are able to come before him with a great boldness in your prayers. And what is so unique is God will guide you into his will and he will guide your prayers into his will. And guess what? When you pray in the will of God, those prayers are going to be answered. And it's going to be incredible to experience. Charles Spurgeon uh, was a great preacher, and he had some words of wisdom about these verses. I wanted to share it with you. And I'm, I'm going to put them on the screen, but I'll read them to you as well. He said this. He said, he who has a clear conscience comes to God with confidence. And that confidence of faith ensures to him the answer of his prayer. Childlike confidence makes us pray as none else can. It makes a man pray for great things, which he would have never have asked for if he had not learned this confidence. And he makes them pray for little things, which a great many are afraid to ask for because they have not yet felt towards God the confidence of children. That, that, that's a very important part here about coming to God as a child, that confidence. I love it when my kids come and ask me for crazy things. Why? Because they think I can do it. <laughs> I love it. They have total confidence. Like, Dad, I need like $5,000 like tomorrow. And like, oh, we have some questions if that's, you know. But, but they're just like, they assume I've got everything, right? And I, I love that about them. That's what it is with God. You got to go to God as a child. But then he says this. This is so important. The man or woman, of course, of, of obedience is the man whom God will hear. Because his obedient heart leads him to pray humbly and with submission. For he feels it to be his highest desire that the Lord's will should be done. Man, what a powerful thought there. Obedience to Christ leads us to pray humbly. So rather than coming to God with a heart of, of fleshly pursuit, God, I need this. God, make this happen. Make this go in my life. Make my, my desires work out. You come to God humbly and says, God, you promised to provide for my needs. And that's what I'm asking for of you, God. I'm asking that humbly. And God, would you please meet those needs? Let's finish the quote. He says, hence, it is then that the man, uh, uh, the man of obedient heart prays like an oracle. That's like a priest. <laughs> prays uniquely. His prayers are prophecies. Man, that's powerful. When you come before God with obedience, your prayers become prophecies. Uh, is he not one with God? Does he not desire and ask for exactly what God intends? How can a prayer shot from such a bow ever fail to reach its target? As from Spurgeon's, the conditions of power in prayer. Believers who have a clear conscience 
confident access and obedient lives that please Christ, we can be assured that God will hear and he will answer our prayers for our good and for our glory. After all, we're like that trusting child coming before a loving father who knows all of my sins. He knows all of my imperfections and yet he still loves me and accepts me and wants what is best for me. Now, this is not a guarantee that you're going to get everything that you want because did you know that sometimes God answers your prayers with no? (laughs) Yeah. You're like, yeah. Why? Because he knows best. And if you're an obedient child, you're okay with that. Sometimes he says, wait, wait. And and you got to be okay with that as well too, which is difficult. But the point being here is that when we come before God as obedient children and we're walking in the light and we're pursuing him, then there's a uniqueness. And I love that phrase, your prayers become a prophecy. And that's not like, oh, I'm being prophetic, but it's the idea that what you're going to pray for is going to happen because you're walking and praying and living in the will of God. And this is an evidence that you are in the truth. So I got to ask you, are you praying in that way? Are you seeing God bring about those answers to prayer as you are seeking his will and pursuing him in this way? Has God changed the things that you pray for? I think that's one of the greatest evidences that God changes your focus in prayer. When you are obedient and following after him, it is amazing to me that in those moments of life that I am, that I, and I try and I, I pursue God with all of my heart, but there's those moments where I really feel like I am, I'm leaning into Christ and I'm, I'm right with him and I have this full confidence that there's just a unique change that takes place in the things that I even ask God for, that I come to him for. My time of praise and adoration seems to extend and expand. And then my, my time of asking becomes very narrow and focused. It doesn't mean I stop praying for you guys. I pray for you all the time. But you know what I'm saying? There's this unique change that takes place as I'm obedient and really pursuing and following God. And this is a way that we know we're in the truth. There is a assurance in our hearts. God is stronger than our hearts. There are answers in our prayers. But thirdly, this morning, there's an abiding in his presence. Look at verse 23. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Within this passage here on assurance, there's another reminder of how you can find ultimate assurance, and that is through salvation in Jesus Christ. And not only salvation in Jesus Christ, if you're saved today, you say amen to that, but also that we should love one another as he gave us commandment. That's, of course, the great commandment that Jesus gave in Matthew, 20, 20, uh, in Matthew 22, uh, which is love God and love others. And John here is emphasizing it again for the fourth time. So I'm not going to re-emphasize it here in this moment, but he's saying, listen, one of the greatest securities is you just trust in Christ. You believe in Christ and you love your fellow man. So he's reemphasizing it. But then he gives us now another encouragement of assurance, and that's the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Verse 24, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. So we dwell in him and Christ dwells in us. And hereby we, what's that word? Say it. We know. We know that he abideth in us. So how do we know that? You say, man, I got the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Well, the spirit which he hath given us. So here, this is key. This is key. The Spirit has been given to us. The person who believes in Jesus Christ dwells in God and God in him by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, John here is looking back to our day of conversion. Can you remember back that far? Do you remember maybe for some of you just a few weeks ago? For some of you, it was maybe several years ago or decades ago, but when you were converted, when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit was given to you. He writes it in the past tense. He's talking about something that has happened already. Remember, he's talking to believers. So you received the Spirit of God. He might have been thinking about what Jesus said in John chapter 7, uh, verse, it's not verse 3, uh, it's verse uh, 36, uh, 37, sorry. But Jesus said this in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And they all said, that is a weird analogy. Verse 39, it gives us clarification what Jesus was saying. But he, Jesus, spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost had not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, again, that reminds us that when Jesus was glorified and went up from this earth, he then gave to us the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, it is better for me to go, because then you will receive the Spirit of God. Think about that. It's better for us to have the Spirit of God within us than the physical representation of God on earth in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. And so he's speaking prophetically about what was going to happen, and what he says here is that when you believe on me, you will receive the Spirit. 
That's awesome. (laughs) You are going to get it. It's a assurance. When you believe in Christ, one of the greatest assurances of our salvation is the presence of the Holy Spirit. John 14 verse 17 speaks of the Spirit as abiding with you and in you. See, God's promise that was fulfilled was that the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit would be within it, within us. Paul spoke about it a lot, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. He says, uh, know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? He says, didn't you know that? You need to know that, folks. You need to know that the Spirit of God is within you. If you are saved, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you receive the Spirit of God. Okay, that's an incredible, incredible thought. And then Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14, this is what he says. I love this in whom you also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, let's stop here for a moment. Let's break this verse down. I I highlighted a few of the words here. Notice here, you hear the word, you hear the gospel, and you believe. You see that? Okay, this is the gospel right here. You hear the word of God, you hear the gospel, and you believe. Notice there's nothing in between there. Nothing between there. The way the person is converted and comes to Christ is you hear the word of God, and you believe in Jesus Christ. You hear the gospel, the good news of the gospel, okay? But, it says, after that, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So those things all happen. You hear the word, you believe the word, you receive the Spirit of God. Verse 14, which is the earnest. That means guarantee. Have you guys ever heard of uh, earnest money before? You guys ever heard that phrase? Uh, I think it used to be like when you're buying a house or something and you want to buy it, you put down some earnest money, which means like you're showing that you're serious about it. I guarantee. Did you know when Jeanette and I, we bought our first house, not here in Vancouver, by the way, um, when we bought our first house, I put down $500 as earnest money to guarantee the purchase of my home. Can you believe it? 500 bucks. Anyway, yeah, I don't have that house anymore. All right, okay. (laughs) Here's what he's saying. When you receive the spirit of God, that is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So until he comes back, until the praise of his glory. Now think about that. That's awesome. When we get saved, we receive the Spirit of God, and that is the guarantee that we are his. And we know we abide in God, and we know that God abides in us because of the promise. This is a promise. This scripture right here, these are promises that when you're saved, you receive the Spirit of God. And by the way, you receive all the Spirit that you're ever going to get. There's no second blessing. There's no second spiritual baptism. There's no works that you can do. The spirit that you get is enough to secure your salvation for eternity. And it is enough for you to do the work of sanctification. And as we learned in 2 Peter, it is all that you need to live for Christ today. Okay, the Holy Spirit, you got it. You got all of it. So stop quenching it. (laughs) Let it flow and let it work within you. All that you need, you have. And the life of faith and obedience that we desire is a reality because of the work of the Spirit in us. And it is an incredible gift that God would not leave us alone, but he would give us his indwelling, abiding spirits, a spirit as assurance of his love and of his salvation. So when our heart condemns us, I'm, I'm finishing up, okay, so stay with me. When our heart condemns us, his spirit reminds us that God is greater than our hearts. When we struggle with imperfect obedience, we know that we can be forgiven and we know that our prayers can be answered. Now, for some, this can be a hard passage to maybe fully grasp, but if we understand it in its simplest form, it's this. The genuinely saved person can live secure in their salvation. They can live above the condemnation of their heart because of the promise and the evidence of the indwelling, abiding Spirit of God, which is a promise that we hold on to because God said it over and over and over again in his word. You have the Spirit of God if you are saved. And so the assurance that is given gives us the desire and then also the ability, this is amazing, the ability to truly love in deed and in truth because it's real. It's real. It is of God. It is not forced. It is not fake. And so you and I can be calmly confident that God's will for us is real and it can be found through simple faith and obedience to his word. John here says, my little children, says I want you to love in deed and I want you to love in truth. Well, what does that mean? If your heart condemns you that you're not in the truth, he gave us some reasons, some ways that you can know that you're in the truth. I hope that you'll be encouraged today. Hope that you'll be encouraged because this is a struggle and I share this from my own heart. This is a struggle that's been in my own heart in, in, in years past. 
I struggled. Why am I still struggling in these areas? And God can give us great assurance of his presence through these three things. The assurance in our hearts, he can give us, um, I'm going to forget them all, so I'm going to make sure I make sure I get them, answers in our prayers, and then abiding in his presence. And I promise you it'll be a big help to you as you trust him.